So we'll get started guys, welcome uh, back. Today we're going to start with a recap. Um, did anyone manage to convince anyone else about trolls, that trolls exist? You did? Yeah. How did it go? I convinced about um, Inca, but not trolls. Inca, but not trolls, yeah, alright. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, does he think the trucks exist or no? No. no. Bradley? I've convinced my brother. Yeah? It's quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> Taj? I've got a couple of things to trace over. It worked quite easily. Oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. In Kenya? Yeah, I talked about it with my dad and he said to me, your definition's wrong. I'm like, well, do you have another one? He said, I'll think of it. Nice. All right. So, he's thinking about philosophy. He's not even here. So, that's great. Okay, so uh, we're just going to do a big, big solid recap of we've learned some pretty complex words um, and we're going to look at some more problems with composites and over the next few weeks we're going to try and come up with some solutions to them. So, um, philosophy, I've said there's four key areas that we're looking at. So, who can remember what is metaphysics about? Kim? Oh, okay. Um, metaphysics is that which is above the physical world. So, you know, as we take it from meta being like, you know, sort of above the physics being, you know, as in like the science based on physics and how things actually function. So it's questions about stuff like God and the universe. And Excellent. Okay, God being the universe, how we come to exist and so forth are all in metaphysics. Okay, and so in one word, it's about reality as such. Very good. Uh, how about epistemology? Anyone remember what that one is? Hey? About knowledge and like how do we know? Very good. So how do we know things? All right, and we assume we come to know things through our senses. Um, can we know things? And then what does it mean to know? Do you have to be certain? So like a good example is, you know, you're pretty sure the sun is going to rise tomorrow. All right, that you'll come out in the morning and you can see the sun coming up. But it, there's a possibility that it might not because the world explodes and you're not here to see it or something like that. All right, so epistemology is about knowledge. Ethics about right action, looking at frameworks to justify it, not just our feelings, but how can we inform it with reason? And then logic is the study of reason. Okay, so they're the four topics of philosophy. So then how about, I might ask one of my year 11s, what about the word philosophy? What does it mean? Eric? Love of wisdom. Love of wisdom, very good. And there was one more word that I said we should try to remember, which was etymology. Who can remember what etymology means? Uh, history of words. History of words, very good. So we've got lots of ologies there, don't we? We've got epistemology, etymology. We're going to have another ology today. Um, so what about ontology? It's the study of? You got the first part right? Existence. Existence, yep. So ontology just means what exists, Nikolai. So if you think pencils exist, they're on your list of ontology, right? So let's do a recap of what we went through last lesson to, to arrive at the, um, the conclusions we did as well. So we started with a paper aeroplane, and I said, you know, how many things do I have here? And we sort of said, well, maybe it's a piece of paper, maybe it's an aeroplane composed of paper, maybe it's one aeroplane composed of a septillion atoms, right? Different ways of looking at it. So those were our possible answers. And then we, this is another word we learned as well, is a simple Okay, and so when we think of science, we break things down in terms of their requisite parts. Okay, and the universe is everything that exists, and you know when we speak in terms of chemistry and physics, things are made of atoms. All right, they're sort of the, the, the mini building blocks that everything is made of. Um, you know, but then you, if you go to uni and study quantum physics, it does go a bit further, and you get into the smaller physical particles that atoms are composed of. Um, theoretical physics, posturing, superstrings, and fit, um, the philosopher says, whatever level we go to, at some level, there's some basic building block. We call that the simple, okay? It's the simple, and everything is composed of symbols. All right, that's what one of the things that philosophy say. Um, so we, you know, different ideas about gunky and junky universes. And we said, so this is how, if you haven't done your homework already to convince someone of in cars existing, let's let's recap how we're going to do it. Let's say, what does it mean for something to exist? Pretty standard definition is you can see it, you can touch it, you can smell it, you can taste it if you want to. You know, does the chair exist? You know, you, you, it's obvious. Of course, it exists. All right. There's a physical instantiation, a physical manifestation of it. All right. So in that circumstance, we've got obviously chairs exist, unicorns. No, nah, 
don't, they don't exist, <coughs> haven't seen them. Okay, so then, then you go to islands. Okay, so people are pretty happy to say, yeah, I believe islands exist, I've seen one, or we live on one. Uh, it's a body of land surrounded by water. There's a physical instantiation of it, physical manifestation, therefore it exists. So you go, well, have you heard about in-cars? A car in a garage, okay? Um, and you say, an in-car is a car in a garage. Is there an in-car somewhere on the planet right now? And of course there is. You, know, you, you might have one at your own house. Maybe you've got a garage and you park your car in. So according to this, in-cars exist. And you say, oh, you just made that up. Yeah, well, you know, you just made up islands. So an island is a relationship between land and water. An in-car is a relationship between a car and a garage. So, you know, you might convince them there. And you, say, and you get even more absurd. How about trogs? You know, tree park, dog park. Um, yeah, but they're not connected. Um, they're not connected. Neither is the car and the garage. The car is inside the garage, right? Maybe the, the dog is under the tree. Um, if the dog is inside the tree, like if there's a hole in the tree and the dog's standing inside it, you, know, you, you can come up with all kinds of absurd ones. So, that's where we sort of stopped. Okay, um, and so what we're getting at is composition does lead some, to some funny, funny questions. So here's a new ology for us. Now, probably year 11s, so I don't expect you to remember this one, but year 12s, so I will. So this is called myriology. So myriology is the study of parts and holes. So that's what we're looking at a little bit at the moment. Okay, we've got, we're talking about metaphysics. Within metaphysics, we've got ontology, what exists. Within ontology, myriology, parts and holes coming together. <coughs> to form something. So, we've got two camps, okay? Because within composites, I'm gonna, this is gonna be the next slide anyway, but I might write it up here. But within compo composites, you can say composites if you like, it is fine. Um, that means something that's composed of smaller parts that come together to make something big. Well, they either exist or they don't exist, all right? So, in the circumstance where they don't exist, we say they're just a product of mind. They're just a useful way for you as an intelligent being to divide up reality. It's useful to pretend that tables exist because you sit at one. It's useful to pretend that dogs and trees exist because you interact with them. Trogs aren't particularly useful because you don't interact with a trog. You interact with its requisite parts. So, those people that say they don't exist, they are called ontological anti-realists. So I don't expect you to remember this kind of terminology. We're going to have it saved in the PowerPoint. So if you are writing an essay about it, you can come back and say, what was it again? Ontological anti-realists, they say composites don't exist. The only thing that's real are those symbols. Everything is symbols, composites don't exist. Now, we said there was one big problem with this line of thinking. Who can remember? What is it? Kim? Um, it denies the existence of a human being. Yeah, it denies the existence of a human being, and presumably you're a human being making the claim. So you end up denying your own existence. Now, you might think that's enough to stop most people entertaining that position. Lots of philosophers believe this is true. <laughs> All right? So then we have the opposite, and they're just called realists. So ontological realists. And they say that ordinary objects, trees, cats, dogs, um, do have real existence apart from a human mind. And so what was the justification? I said, think about it temporally. Think about um, 70 million years ago when the dinosaurs were still on the planet. Did they exist? All right? Because we don't have a human mind there to divide up reality into those sort of um, mind-dependent categories, do we? Okay, so ontological realists. But today, we're going to look at some problems in this direction. We're going to say, what are some of the problems with uh, ontological realism? So there are a number of problems. Um, I think with the year 11s, I'm just going to talk about the first one, and the year 12s with the first one. And then with the year 12s, we might have a conversation about these other three with you guys a bit later. So the first one is about identity. So, if you believe in composites, you believe that composites exist, it means you believe a chair is composed of atoms. All right? That's what you believe. It's composed of atoms or at some level it is composed of symbols. 
So the classic thought experiment about it is called the ship of Theseus. So you 12s, you've heard of this before? Yep, excellent. Your 11s? Anyone heard of the ship of Theseus? Where do you think the name Theseus comes from? What kind of name does it sound like? Greek. Excellent. It's a Greek name. If anyone says anything about philosophy, just assume it's Greek. You know? That's where the ancients, uh, two and a half thousand years ago, were talking about philosophy. Theseus is a Greek hero. And he's got a Tyrene. I'm going to bring a Tyrene up uh, here. Here's a Tyrene. And interestingly about these ships, you know, the way they would perform naval warfare, you can actually see this on Assassin's Creed, by the way. Yes, they, they used to try and ram one another. All right, see this big spike at the end? If you ram it into a ship, it splits it in half or puts a massive hole in it. So when they're having naval combat, they get real close together and they just try and ram into the side of one of the other ships, cut it in half, the ship sinks, battle one. So that's a Tyrene. Theseus has a Tyrene. All right, and he's sailing around ancient Greece. So if you know Greece on the map, it's sort of like, a, it's a peninsula, but there's lots of islands, lots of islands around ancient Greece. And he's traveling around, being a hero, um, saving people and um, helping the farmers out. But as he sails around, of course, his ship starts to deteriorate a bit, doesn't it? He gets exposed to the wind and the weather and the elements. And so as time goes on, he needs to start replacing parts, okay? Um, and I've got a really cool way I can do this sometimes is if I bring in Lego blocks and I can show you, but I didn't bring them in today. But let's say he's sailing along and you can imagine, you know, he sails from Athens to Mykonos and he needs to replace some of the planks of wood. So he pulls those planks of wood out from the side, all right, um, puts them on the ground and then puts some new pieces of wood in, all right, and then he sails on his merry way, okay? So some of those parts have changed. And he sails then, he goes from Mykonos and he goes all the way to Troy, to participate in the Battle of Troy. And at Troy, like the mast snapped, so he had to put the mast down and change the mast. He had to change the oars, he had to change the back. Okay, you can imagine this, it keeps happening. Every journey he makes, there's bits of the boat that he has to replace. Okay, until eventually he has replaced every single piece of wood in the boat. Okay, so we, let's just reflect on that for a moment. So he's sailed this ship around and he's ended up replacing every piece of wood, every piece of metal. Does he have a brand new ship? Is it the same ship? What, 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 what the, some of you, your 11s reckon? You told us what happened about Harry? Yep, well, yes. Well, it wouldn't be a brand new ship because, of course, each bit was replaced at a different time and would have a different amount of wear on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it, is it a different ship? At that point, yeah, it would be a different ship. Yeah, what did you say, sorry, Mary? It's renovated. It's renovated. It's renovated. It's a renovated ship. Yep, yep, yep. Any other ideas? Not sure. So this escalates in complexity though, Gemma, because unbeknownst to Theseus as he was sailing along, there was a guy who followed him and really admired Theseus and he really liked him and he thought, I'm going to collect the parts that he's throwing away at this ship. I'm going to collect all of those parts and he's following and he collects all of the parts and he makes his own ship. And he says, look, everyone, I've got Theseus' ship. All of the parts that he threw out are formed into the exact same ship that he had before. So we've got two ships now, don't we? We've got the Theseus ship that's been renovated, where he slowly replaced all the parts. And we've got the ship that Bob, who followed him around, he's a big fan of Theseus, used to build his own ship and claims that it's Theseus' ship. Who has Theseus' ship? Right. Bob. Bob, you reckon? Yeah. yeah. How come? Because it's the part that Theseus used. It's just the amount to it, yeah, make his ship. Yeah, so because it's the parts, you're saying if he has all the parts, he's got his ship. Yeah. Yeah. So whose ship does Theseus have? It's a new one. It's a new one. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, Theseus has Theseus's ship because it's, uh, like, mentally, it's his. He owns the ship. He, Built the ship from, um, from not ground up, but part by part, or whatever. Yeah, um, and I guess Bob may own the 
it's like if I bought something secondhand from someone, I don't say, oh, this is his thing. I just have it now. Yeah. I would say, oh, this is my thing. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So instead of being like a material thing saying, this is his, it's more of a mental, like I have ownership of it, it's mine. Cool. Yep. Uh, Chelsea, you got any thoughts? Which ship is Theseus, do you reckon? His ship or Bob's? His, yep, yep. So, this, and so, you know, we've, we've, we've done the thought experiment, but what's it in the context of? It's in the context of why are there problems with composites? Okay, because you're a composite being, and the, 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 the symbols that make up your body are changing every second. Every second, you exhale a breath, you've changed the matter that makes up your being. Alright? If you scratch your arm and then you know you've had some dead skin dissipate in space, you're a different being because your parts have changed. So the, 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 the paradox with identity is if you are just your parts, then you're never the same person. Alright? If the chair is just its parts, then it's not the same chair anymore. It's a different chair, it's a different chair, it's a different chair, it's a different chair. So if composition says, if one of our understandings of composition is the whole, the whole thing is just the parts. It's just the parts, all right? Um, but each time, parts change, don't they? With every second that passes. So that's the first problem with composites. That's the one that we'll look at. Again, you can think of the reason I put a bike up there as well. You can think about the bike. You can change the bike tire, put a new bike tire on. You do a skid, you've lost a bit of tread on your bike tire. Not a gnarly skid, but you've lost a bit of tread. Different bike. Okay. Um, so that's one of the problems with saying that composites exist. All right. How how does something retain its identity if its parts are always changing? Um, so this just came to my mind. Uh, like. If we go, you know, as soon as um, Bob does have Theseus' ship, at what point does Theseus have his ship? Exactly. Is it the first time he's changed, or is it as soon as he gets rid of the last bit, which is his, which is his tail? Like, I sort of think in my like future, if we could replace bad bits of our brain for new bits, uh, is it the point where we take out the bit that knows us and replace that, that we become a new person? Yeah. Or is it the point where we change two, three things, or just one? Yeah, exactly. Yep. And so, and so, what, the problem with uh, identity is that as soon as you change one part, if the if the whole is just the parts, as soon as you change one part, it's a completely different being. All right. It's a completely different being. So, how does something retain identity if the parts change? How can you be the same person if you've changed the breath in your lungs? Well, like if somebody has kidney failure and they remove the kidney they already have and get a transplant, it's still in their body, they're not new. Like it's the still kidney, their body, yeah. Yeah, but like kidneys, yes, the kidney is new, mm. it's functioning, but still it runs with their blood system and like that. So. Yeah. So, and you can entertain this experiment lots of ways. You can say, what if you slowly, slowly, slowly replaced every part in your body? But you don't even need to do that because contemporary science will tell you that every seven years you replace every atom in your body. And that's mind boggling to think of is that you grow, you shed your skin, all right? You, 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 you ingest food, it gets processed by your body, and that's how you grow. It nourishes your brain, it changes that. All of the atoms that make up your body are constantly changing, and yet this person is like some source of identity remains. So we will entertain some solutions for that in the coming lessons. But here's one problem with this way of thinking. Okay, if we say um, composites exist and they are just their parts, what we're doing is called reductionism. We're reducing some complex phenomena to its parts. All right, things that the whole is often more complex or um, there's more to it than just its parts. So if you can think of Harry Potter as a collection of books, as a novel, as a series, um, 
you could say, oh, that's just ink on a page. All right? Because ultimately, it, that's all it is. It's just carbon atoms on top of carbon atoms with indistinct shapes and squiggles. But it conveys some meaning. It conveys a magical story that all of you guys have had some sort of exposure to. It's in the minds of millions of people across the world. Can we reduce Harry Potter to ink on a page? Can we reduce Beethoven? You can play it through Spotify. All right? Uh, it's in binary code, which is just ones and zeros. That's all the computer's reading, and then it's processing that to make the speaker vibrate and produce the sound that Beethoven wrote 400 years ago. All right? Is his music just ones and zeros? Or is it more complex than that? Is there something to it? How about love? You know, you guys love your parents. Maybe your partner one day, maybe your partner now. Um, your children one day, all right? Is love, is it just some chemical reaction that takes place inside this bag of carbon? Or are, are the, is the whole more complex, more real than the parts? So this is a question we're getting at, all right? So we've got the division here. Composites exist. People are more real than their parts. Think of the world you interact with. Do you interact with atoms? Or do you interact with other people? All right. The anti-realists say um, people aren't real. Simples are what is real. The world is composed of simples. Um, we reduce the complex phenomena to its parts. There is a good argument to be made here because it's simple. Parsimonious. So here's where we're at. We've got two problems because both don't work out. All right. Both don't necessarily work out straight away anyway. Do ordinary objects exist as ontological realities? Do chairs, do tables, do humans exist? All right. If it's the case, then how does something retain its identity? There's multiple problems there, but one is about identity. And those are the problems of composites. Trogs. Do trogs exist? All right. If they're just silly and made up, why do trogs not exist but trees and dogs do? All right. Or we say, no, all categories of mind, none of them actually exist, it's just um, simple, so then we deny our own existence. All right, any comments? We're pretty well finished there. Cool, so we will have a bit of a, bit more of a discussion about it.